Well, good morning. Uh, it's such a blessing to be fellowshipping together this morning, and uh, I'll say a very warm welcome to you all, but I don't think that will be true. I was quite surprised driving in today and just seeing how cold it was, and like, man, it's even raining here. Where are we? <laughs> we were joking with my wife. I feel like we're in a different country or something right now. So, um, but uh, greetings from uh, Covenantus Christian. I know this morning they're being, or we're being, or still are being faithful, and even praying for us, praying for you as a church. We meet as uh, as pastors um, twice a week, and you, this church is, is, is often in our prayers. So I uh, know that uh, we are striving together for the progress of the gospel, even though we are, uh, we are, we are quite a distance apart. But thankful for the ministry that you're doing, and thankful for how God is using you here. Well, our text for today is in uh, Mark chapter 9, so if you have your Bibles, please turn over to Mark chapter 9, and that's where we'll be today. Mark chapter 9, and I believe you've been going through the book of Mark. Yes? Yes. Yes, okay. (laughs) Uh, And so um, I I believe uh, a lot of context has been laid out for us over the last a few weeks or months that you've been going through the book of Mark. So we have the joy together today of uh, walking through verse 14 to verse uh, 20 uh, to verse 29. Now it's quite a long text. I won't read it, but I hope as we walk through the text, we'll be able to, to, to read it together. Now the setting of this text is just after Jesus and his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, have come down from the mountain where Jesus uh, was transfigured. Do you remember that and going through that? And they'd gotten this preview of Jesus' second coming, the disciples had, a glimpse of his glory and how Jesus was unveiled, in a sense, in his glory and what the future kingdom might look like. The account in our text today is recorded by all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all the Gospels except John, But Mark really has the most extensive detail of this text. Now, from that glimpse of the future, now just just imagine, uh, I believe you've gone through this, where where they're on the mountain and they see Jesus' glory unveiled and and just this longing of, man, this is what heaven must be like, where we shall see him just as he is. From this high point, then they come down the mountain to again be faced with this sin-cursed reality (laughs) of this world. Uh, Luke chapter 9 verse 37 tells us that this is the next day after the transfiguration, after they come down from the mountain. But uh, in our text today from verse 14, we read that, now this is a day after the transfiguration, when they came back to the disciples, this is now the four of them, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Verse 15 says, immediately when the entire crowd saw him, that is Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. Let us, let me pray for us and then we will continue walking in this text. Father, we thank you for the blessing of, um, the blessing of prayer, the blessing of relying upon you to understand your word, the blessing of relying upon you to live this life that you have called us to live. I pray, Father, that even as we walk through this text today, we may be so dependent upon you, not just for communicating your word, reading your word, but understanding your word. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you open our hearts. I pray that you may rebuke us where we are unruly. You may help us where we are weak. And you may encourage us, Lord, where we are faint-hearted. So thank you, Father. We ask and pray this through your son's name. Amen. So Jesus comes down from the mountain with his disciples. There's an argument that's happening. The four of them come down. They met with this argument, a dispute between primarily the scribes and the disciples with a crowd that's around them. We don't know how big this crowd was, but we get the implication as we walk through the text that this was, this was quite a significant number of people. He arrives and their attention suddenly shifts from this argument between the disciples and the scribes to Jesus. 
The crowd has two responses that we're going to see in verse 14 and 15. First of all, they run to him. And then second of all, they're, they're just amazed is what the text tells us. Now, I couldn't help but stop and ask, why are they amazed? Why, what makes them so amazed? Jesus hasn't even said a word. It is unlikely, although my mind wanted to gravitate there at first, it is unlikely that it had anything to do with the transfiguration or that Jesus had this glow on his face or anything of that sort. Because earlier on in verse 9 of Mark chapter 9, Jesus had charged his disciples and told them not to tell anyone what they had seen. So it's clear Jesus didn't want people to know what had happened up there, and so very unlikely it had anything to do with the transfiguration. But most likely this amazement was based on how Jesus just arrived at just the most opportune time, at just the right time in this argument that they're having. But at any rate, they run to him, and it says in verse 16 to 18, and then he asks them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute, and whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. So Jesus gets there, asks the most obvious question when he gets there. Coming down from the mountain, there's this noise that's happening. What are you arguing about? What's this commotion about? The NASB, the NASB, the New American Standard Version, says discussion, but I think the most literal rendering here is argument, because that's the very same word that's used earlier on in verse 14 for argue. So what are you arguing about? Verse 17 then tells us that there is a man from the crowd who stands up. And we're going to try and take other uh, passages from the parallel passages to help us get a fuller picture of what's happening. Uh, but you don't have to turn there to all these passages. Luke chapter 9, verse 38 of the same account tells us that he shouted, which might signify how loud this crowd was or how charged this discussion had been, or both. Matthew's account in Matthew 17, verse 14, tells us that this man just fell on his knees before Jesus, just showing us how desperate his situation was. So, what is his story? The man has a son. Luke chapter 9, verse 38, fills in some more details by telling us that this is his only son. He has no other son. His only son. And this son is possessed with a spirit that makes him mute. We learn later on in our text for today, in Mark chapter 9, verse 25, that it doesn't just make him mute, doesn't just make this boy mute, but it also makes him deaf. Matthew's account uses the word lunatic and ill in the father's description of his son. My son is a lunatic. My son is ill. This is a desperate situation. Well, how does this affect the boy? Verse 18 tells us that this spirit, this illness, slams him to the ground, makes him foam at the mouth, grind his teeth, and stiffen out. Mark chapter 9 verse 22 also fills in detail to say that this boy often fell into the fire and water. And verse 21 of Mark chapter 9 tells us that this has been like that from the moment this child was born, from childhood. So you can imagine the desperate situation of the father here. This boy is probably, as he comes before Jesus, he's probably scarred from burns that he has had from falling in the fire of all these years. He almost always has had someone to walk with him, watch him at every moment, every second. You can imagine how many times he has almost died from drowning or from burning to death, from the open wells that were around there at that time, from the open fires that were common for cooking at that time. What his face must have looked like, even his lips from continuously biting his lips. You can imagine what this boy probably looked like in the desperate situation of the dad. So this is obviously a very emotional and desperate situation for the father as he comes to look for help. He, he, he's heard about Jesus, but 
he, he, he tries to find Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus has gone up the mountain, but he finds his disciples. And he's probably heard also that the disciples have helped other people as well. But here's the problem. For some reason, the disciples are not able to help his son. Now, about a year earlier from this situation, we learn from Mark chapter 3, verse 15, that Jesus had given his disciples authority to cast out demons. We know from Mark chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, that in this authority they'd been given, they'd been very successful. In Mark chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, we read that the disciples went out and preached that men should repent. In verse 13, we read that they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So obviously they had been successful in this power and this news had spread around and it was evident that they could do it. So what happened? You can imagine what questions could have been going on in the crowd's minds, in this father's mind. Hey, if you helped others, how come you can't help him? Are there some demons that are more powerful than the power of this Jesus that you tell us? Tell, explain to us. And so an argument is ensuring as Jesus comes down, and that's the setting of what's happening. Now look at verse 19 to 22, and Jesus' first diagnosis of this crowd, the father, the disciples, and this predicament, the first diagnosis that he gives in verse 19, he says, and I'll read from verse 19 to 22, and he answered them, the dad has come, told us the situation, and he says in verse 19, he answered them and says, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy up to him, when he saw him, when the boy saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and to the water to destroy him. But if he can do anything, take pity on us and help us. So in verse 19, Jesus points this situation, this problem points to the problem as being a problem of belief, a problem of faith. It is a problem of faith for the generation that is before him, and in there it includes the disciples. How long shall I be with you? He asks. You know, you could see this kind of in a negative way, but I think given the context, this is really positive. Because remember, where has Jesus just come down from? The mountain, the transfiguration, the most intimate fellowship he's had with the Father ever since he came. This is kind of giving us a glimpse, this longing that Jesus has of fellowship with the Father in heaven that he has just experienced. He's looking forward to that time again. But it also may have been a, a, a possible moment where we know the devil is tempted, we tempted Jesus so many times in the Bible, possible moment where he was tempted yet again, yet again by Satan to say, hey, look, they don't trust you when you're here. If they don't, don't trust you when you're here, how do you think they're going to trust you when you're gone? But in all this, we know Christ didn't sin. Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that. But at any rate, we're made to presume and to believe that, that, that during during Jesus and his other three disciples' absence, the, something, something else happened with the disciples. There's this spirit of laxity, of unbelief, of self-reliance of, oh, that had overcome the disciples while he was gone. Jesus will come back to them and talk to them, and we'll talk about that later on when he talks to them in private. But in, 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 in this case, you start seeing Jesus pointing to this problem of faith, and then he, he starts talking to the Father directly. It's not just the disciples' faith that are in question, but also the Father's faith that's in question. And for the disciples, we'll address that later. But look at in verse 22, where the Father gives this clause, this if clause, and says, if you can do anything, it says in verse 22, 
And on this word, if, <laughs> Jesus picks up that conversation with the boy's father in verse 23. Look at verse 23 to 24. And Jesus said to him, now speaking to the father, if you can, that's how the father ends it. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. He says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now Jesus highlights in verse 23 that the question to the father is not whether Jesus has the power to heal the boy. That's not the question. Whether I have the power to heal the boy, but if you as the father have faith that I can actually heal your son. You see the difference I say? In other words, it's not whether I can, but whether you believe I can. And there's a huge difference that's there. The father's response is so honest at this point, <laughs> and then shows how his faith is just not where it should be, where it's not perfect, and he does need help, even in his faith. I do believe, but help my what? Help my unbelief. Verse 25 says, when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. Jesus sees the crowd coming in verse 25. It's gathering rapidly. Since we, we've heard of a crowd running toward Jesus, we haven't heard of a crowd withdrawing from Jesus. So this is, this is probably a reference to more people actually coming to Jesus and, 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 and hearing more of this commotion and more people are coming to add to the crowd that was already there. But Jesus wants to avoid this publicity. So he casts out the demon before it gets really crowded. He shows his power as God in that even demons listen to him. Even evil spirits listen to him. And he commands that, well, he commands that and casts out this demon. Notice one thing, it is immediate and it is permanent. Now, it's easy at this point to camp here and discuss the theology of demons and Satan. And I'm sure many of you are waiting for us to do that. But while there's much to be said and it's very interesting and much to be learned, this is not the point of the text. Remember there was a problem. A boy was demon possessed and the disciples failed to cast out the demon. The problem was diagnosed by Jesus to be a problem of faith. Jesus cast out the demon and we'll see again Jesus giving the solution to this problem in the last two verses. Look at verse 28 and verse 29. The issue is about faith. When he came into the house, verse 28 of Mark chapter 9, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we drive it out? And he said to them, verse 29, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. So the purpose of this miracle was beyond the healing of the boy, as important as that was, and, and, and was beyond uh, the, 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 the healing of the boy, and as merciful as that was, it was more for the disciples themselves to teach them a spiritual lesson. In private, they then asked Jesus, and I find this interesting, that they didn't, they didn't shout out this question in front of the crowd, like, hey, Jesus, how come we didn't do this? How come this didn't work? You can imagine the embarrassment probably they would have felt at this point, like, yeah, but maybe when we are by ourselves, should we, ask, should we ask this question? Why were we not able to accomplish this when you were able to accomplish it? Why did we fail this time when we have been so successful before? What's different? Matthew's account gives us more detail before we look at those last two verses in, 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 in Mark. But I'll actually ask you to turn to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 17, and, and this is kind of sandwiched between the last two verses of Mark, of verse 28 and verse 29, but in Matthew chapter 17, there's, there's, another, there's another part that gives us more insight into what Jesus is going to be saying here. 
Are you there? Great. So, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 to 20, Jesus, it says that then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? Verse 20, and he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Of course, the saying of move this mountain is more of a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a literal mountain that it's talking about here, but it's, it's basically talking about you, within that context of God's will, when you take the broader picture of scripture, within that context of God's will, whatever you ask for will be done. So Jesus is saying you failed and you were powerless because of the littleness of your faith. That's the point here. They had saving faith, which made them come to Christ. They had a relationship with Christ. They had saving faith that they could not lose. But in our walk as Christians, we are called to have this growing faith in trusting Christ completely. The illustration of the mustard seed here in Matthew is not so much emphasizing its size, or its ab but, but rather the, its ability to grow. Does that make sense? Remember in the parable of the mustard seeds, very familiar text to us in Matthew chapter 13 uh, of, of, of the mustard seed in Matthew 13 verse 32. Jesus emphasizes and explains that when, it's, when it is full grown, when he's talking about the gospel and the impact of the gospel, that when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the emphasis here is not so much on the size, but something that becomes small and it continues to what? To grow. So, what is the littleness of faith? It is the kind of faith that does not grow. The kind of faith that does not grow or is not growing. It is the kind of faith that believes in God when everything is fine. <laughs> when everything is fine. When, when, you, when, when, when you have everything you need. When it's easy to trust him, when, when you have all the necessities of life, when you have all the health that you need, that is easy for me to trust and believe in God. But when circumstances change, when you're in need, when you, when, 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 when you don't have everything in you, then your faith wavers and gives way to doubt. Do you have little faith? You have to ask. Do you find it easy to trust God only when things are going well? Do you trust God when, 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 when your finances are great? Yes, it's easy, but what about when your finances are threatened? When you're looking at that budget and it just doesn't fit, it just doesn't, you just don't know how it's going to work out. Where is your faith then? When there's no food. When your children are disobeying and there's no hope, like, what, what is wrong with these kids? Where is your faith then? When people malign you, when, when you might lose your job, when you don't know what's going to happen, where is your faith then? The littleness of faith, faith that not, not, does not grow, is often seen in it being easy only when things are good. What is a little faith? What is a littleness of faith? It is the kind of faith that does not grow. It is the kind of faith that sees things going well for so long, for so long, it starts to believe that it must be because of me. It starts to believe it must be because of my obedience, my goodness, my faithfulness, my relationship with God. My prayers, my reading God's word, my cleverness, and oh boy, my, I am just, it is just because of me. And not because of his grace. It slowly shifts, slowly shifts from spending so much time in prayer with him to relatively seconds in a day in prayer. And I think this is where the disciples were. Because if you go back to Mark chapter 9, 
Matthew has helped us to understand this aspect of its, its growing faith. And you disciples are now at this place where you're, you're, you're stuck. And I think this is where the disciples were in Mark chapter 9. Look at how Mark chapter 9 ends in verse 29. He says to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Apparently they would taken for granted the power given to them or had come to believe that it was inherent in themselves. So much so that they stopped even depending on God for it. And it showed even in their weakness and this lack of prayer in itself. What is little faith? Little faith is one that does not persevere in believing and in praying. It is not like that parable of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. It does not grow in believing that God works in his own time to the things that align to his will. I had one incident uh, just this, this past week. We, we drilled a, a borehole at our house about, uh, I think about a year ago. Uh, we drilled twice and we could not find water, twice. And uh, a, a, a brother had, uh, had, had actually given us money to drill this, this well. But we didn't find water last year. It was so discouraging. It was so discouraging. And then uh, the rainy season started, and then uh, this brother uh, then said, Hey, uh, my son is praying for you that your well may have water. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, that's really cute, you know, but a seven year old praying, that's great, you know, but uh, it's, yeah, we already covered that hole. We, you know, I even put cement over it. <laughs> it's just done, right? But every time he would call, My son is still praying for your well. Okay, right. Right, again and again, my son is still praying for that world that it will have water. And then just this last week, again he said it, hey, my son is still praying. I said, oh, man, this kid is so persistent. <laughs> you know what's going on? Now I have to dig up this cement. I'll just check for the sake of this kid. I'll just check. And then I checked, opened, dug up the cement. It was yesterday or the day before yesterday. Um, put in a rope in there, you know, uh, and, and a spanner down there, put it down to so 70 meters deep, you know. And then it's like after like 40 meters, like what is that, right? There's water in there. What is going on, right? It's like, oh, great. This is great. Now probably I have to do a capacity test to see if this is something that is actually real. But it made me stop and think. Man, this kid has so much to teach me about prayer and persistence and faith that he would not stop to pray for something that almost seems impossible in my mind, like that persistent widow. Puts us to shame. One author um, wrote a biography, I was talking about George Miller, and he says, and I quote, during one point of his ministry, the 19th century Christian leader, George Miller, began to pray for five personal friends. It was not until five years later that the first one of them came to Christ. After five more years, two more of them became Christians. And after 25 years, the fourth man was saved. He prayed for the fifth friend until the time of his death, a few months after which the last friend came to salvation. For that friend, George Mueller had prayed for more than 50 years. I mean, I think of that. I say, how little is my faith? doesn't persist, right? It, 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 it ends up trusting in itself. How little is my faith? Prayer has been given as a blessing to us to show our dependence on God and grow in our faith. When your faith does not grow, and, 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 and it will show in how much you, you this, how much how, how much less sincerely you pray before God. And when your faith does not grow, you become powerless. Now I have to be careful in how I say that. God uses our faith for our good. He uses our faith for our good, for us to know him. Just like this miracle was primarily for the disciples to know him. Of course, God is not at the mercy of our faith to act. Please hear me say that. He is not at the mercy of our, act, of our faith to act. He is not a slave to how much faith we have or do not have. 
In fact, in this miracle, God still worked, despite the littleness of faith displayed by the disciples and the boy's father. He acts even when there is no faith. As represented by this, he says that this faithless generation in verse 19, but God also works through our faith expressed even in prayer. James 5 verse 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, I don't know how all of this works. I don't. I don't know how all of this works. But somehow, in God's economy, matching it with his sovereignty and our prayers, he makes them align together perfectly and for our good and for his glory. What I know is that God uses our prayers to grow us in our faith and works even through our prayers. I don't know what is going on in your life, but know that God sometimes acts despite your faith and sometimes in his sovereign plan that we do not understand because of your faith. How is your faith today? Is it growing? Is it growing or is it stagnant? Sometimes the things happening and circumstances happening are there to make us stop and grow that mustard seed faith. And, 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 and for us to know that things cannot move apart from our faith in God and God using that. How is your faith today? How is your faith today? Let me pray for us this morning. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your kindness and thank you for this text. Lord, I am rebuked even as I have been studying to see how little my faith is oftentimes, Lord. How I am so reliant upon myself and have become like the disciples and how I am not as prayerful as I should be. And I'm sure many of my brothers and sisters here will say amen to that in their own lives as well. But Father, I am so thankful, I am so thankful that you are not at the mercy of our faith. I'm so thankful that you, you, you use our faith within your sovereign plan, Lord, in, in a way that, it, that only you can understand. And you're so concerned about our spiritual growth that you would have us grow in our faith. Thank you that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. And Father, I pray asking for forgiveness for the ways we have not trusted you, for the ways we depend upon ourselves, the ways we are not persistent in, in trusting you, for the ways that we take things into our own hands, for the ways that we do not believe you. We may not say it in those ways or in those words, but it is true, Lord, in how we live. The ways that we do not believe you. Forgive us, Father. Help our unbelief. We ask and pray this through your son's name. Amen.